Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody tonight? Good, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Raziam from the Public Services Office. Just wanted to thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Let's jump right in, shall we? Uh, built by Lockheed Martin Space Systems and managed by JPL, NASA's Genesis spacecraft was launched from Kennedy Space Center in August 2001. Placed into a halo orbit around the L1 Lagrange point for 886 days, the sample return mission collected solar wind samples outside of Earth's magnetosphere and then returned them to Earth, rather dramatically, on September 8, 2004. The data collected, such as isotopic and elemental relative abundances of the solar wind, will provide a cornerstone data set for theories on how, starting some 4.6 billion years ago, the solar nebula transformed into the present solar system. Tonight's speaker is both the principal investigator of the Genesis Discovery Mission and professor of nuclear geochemistry emeritus in the Division of Geo Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. He received his PhD in nuclear chemistry from UC Berkeley in 1963 and has been associated with Caltech where he did his postdoc work ever since. As a postdoc fellow from 1963 to 1965, as an associate professor in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences from 1965 to 1968, as an associate professor from 1968 to 1974, and as a professor from 1974 to 2006. In that time, he has served on many committees, including the Mars Surveyor Advisory Committee, worked on many different projects, including being the principal investigator on the Apollo 17 Lunar Neutron Probe Experiment, and won numerous awards, including the NASA Distinguished Science Award. His research interests cover a wide range of problems, all mostly associated with the synthesis and analysis of the chemistry of our solar system. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Dr. Don Burnett. Okay, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to come to you tonight and tell you where we're at in terms of the Genesis project. We are still a work in progress, but uh, as you'll see, we've come a long way. So let me start off and just by introducing the team. Genesis is a collaboration between the Caltech symbol represents the whole Genesis science team, JPL who managed and played a major role in developing the payload, Lockheed Martin who built the spacecraft, Los Alamos Laboratory which built our various instruments, uh, the Johnson Space Center, which provided the materials going out and has taken care of them coming back, and the Mid-Continent Regional e Educational Laboratory, who handled all our outreach efforts. Okay, this is our proposal slide, and this is a picture of a conception by Bill Hartman, who's a planetary science at the University of Arizona in Tucson, of what the solar nebula looked like. It was what was happening when you went through the stage of the matter that was now in the whole solar system, including our bodies, which prior to that time was associated with stars. And subsequent that time has been associated with our solar system. So we think about this as understanding the transition between star and planet. Star before, planet afterwards. And as you can see, Hartman's conception of the solar nebula is a mixture of dust particles he doesn't put a scale on here, so you can use your imagination whether this thing is one micron in size or one kilometer in size. Uh, presumably at one point, they were all there. And the gas in there, which is part of the diffusing and scattering of the light. And all this material is flowing happily towards the sun, except some of it will get left behind and end up being the solar system as we know it. Okay, uh, in this series, you've heard talks on the Earth's atmosphere, you heard talks on these marvelous moons of Saturn. The scale and focus of Genesis will be a little bit different, be much smaller. Genesis is focusing on atoms, in this particular case, atoms from the sun. And so uh, in the universe, there are essentially 83 different kinds of atoms which make up the periodic table. They are not all of equal abundance and of equal importance. Let's focus on one which is important to pretty much everybody, oxygen. We are happily breathing oxygen at this time, but the oxygen we are breathing is molecular oxygen, which is a molecule cons consisting of two uh, oxygen atoms. Let's look at those oxygen atoms. Here's a cartoon view of an oxygen atom, which consists of an electron cloud 
and a nucleus. The nucleus has most of the mass, well over 99% of the mass, but in fact the size is grossly exaggerated in this diagram. There's maybe 10,000 times the diameter of the electron cloud compared to the actual true diameter of the nucleus. If we look up close at the nucleus of an oxygen atom, we find that it has eight protons that makes it oxygen. Okay? In this electron crowd, then there will be, for an oxygen atom, there will be eight electrons to match the eight protons. But inside the nucleus of an oxygen atom, there can be not a fixed number of neutrons, but there can be variable numbers of neutrons. So if there are eight neutrons to go with the eight protons, we add neutrons and protons together since they're, you know, weigh pretty much the same, and we refer to that as oxygen 16. Most of the oxygen you are breathing, over 99% of it, is oxygen 16. But there are two rare, what we call isotopes, oxygen atoms which have nine neutrons, which 8 plus 9 is 17, we refer to then as oxygen 17, and then a kind of oxygen which has 10 neutrons, which is referred to as oxygen 18. So there are three different flavors of oxygen. And what will be the focus, of, a focus of this talk, is that the relative amounts of these isotopes, the proportions of them, of the ratio of 18 to 16 to 17 to 16, varies for reasons we don't understand among different parts of the solar system. And I will <clears throat> try to tell you what we've done to address the origin of that, those differences. Okay, so we want atoms from the sun. Uh, where do we get atoms from the sun? Fortunately, we do not have to go to the sun to get atoms from the sun. The sun comes to us. This is a picture of a solar eclipse taking advantage of the very, very marvelous coincidence that the projected diameter of the moon across the disk of the sun pretty much exactly matches the size of the sun as viewed from the earth. And so when you blot out most of the light when the moon blots out most of the light from the sun, what you see there is this leftover glow. A very famous series of photographs over the years. People chase eclipses to get these photographs. And what you're seeing here is what's known as a solar corona. This is the very outer tenuous atmosphere of the sun. It's very high temperature material. And most importantly for our purposes, it's not staying on the sun. It's leaving the sun. And when it leaves the sun and comes out in the interplanetary space, we refer to that as a solar wind. And the solar wind, as we speak, is flowing past the Earth happily. And so if you want solar matter, you just got to get outside the Earth and collect it. Okay, um, another point which is worth mentioning is that the elements in the solar wind are not atoms. They are stripped of some of their electrons, and we refer to as ions. So, for example, if I take an oxygen atom, I pump in energy, and I will form an oxygen ion by stripping off an electron. This energy, to do that, we refer to as the first ionization potential. Okay, it's the amount of energy it takes to go from an oxygen atom to an O plus ion. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. So I can go on, then I can take an O plus ion, I can add some different, different amounts of energy, and I can get an O double plus atom ion and so forth. And because of the very high temperature of the corona, the elements coming out in the solar wind are very highly ionized, which allows them to be accelerated in the process of, of coming out. So they come out at relatively high velocities. And that's a reflection of the very high temperature, millions of degrees prevalent in the solar corona. Okay, so now we know what we want to get. We know where to get it. How do we do it? Uh, we, as this was said in the introduction, we just took a spacecraft and put it outside the terrestrial magnetosphere. The solar wind cannot penetrate the magnetosphere, so we have to get outside it. We then expose materials. These solar wind ions that I just talked about are accelerated to, this is a fancy way of saying velocity, it's energy per unit mass. And at this energy, they're implanted in the stick. We are in the range that's been studied for years in the material science world of ion implantation. So it's well known that we stick your material out there in the solar wind, the solar wind will embed itself and stick. We exposed for two years, and the amount, though, we soak up affluence is the number of atoms per unit area, number of atoms per square centimeter of solar wind. These are fairly low, so these materials have to be pure. So we, when we see magnesium in some of our collectors, we know it came from the sun. It was not the impurities of magnesium in the sample. And then we're a sample return mission. So we return these materials to Earth and analyze them in the terrestrial laboratories. Okay, in the sort of top level, why we did this, or what we want to do, we want to measure the relative proportions of the isotopic abundance of the elements, like I illustrated for auction, to a level of precision that you need for planetary science purposes. We knew in advance these variations were not going to be very big, so we had to be prepared to measure fairly small differences. We also want to pay attention to the elements. 
In other words, the ratio of oxygen to silicon to iron to magnesium, so forth and so forth, so forth to, to improve what we know about the knowledge of these elemental devices. These are already known to some degree from the interpretation of the absorption lines in the spectrum of the sun, which allows you to have some idea what the sun is made of. Also, we're a sample return mission. One of the main goals of a sample return mission is leave some behind. So that, for at least for the samples of the extraterrestrial samples you brought back, you, in principle, don't have to do it again. Okay. So anyone who wants to study these in the future, there will be material left over. A, a very important goal. And then it's far less obvious than perhaps these three. In fact, there are three different kinds of soil wind. <clears throat> so in fact, we set up to sample these different kinds of soil winds separately. And actually, I, I'm really not going to be able to talk about the data we have on these, but I can't resist showing you a little bit about what these are and where they come from because they have, they're great pictures. Okay, if you look at the sun in visible light, of course, it's a glowing bright sphere. But if you look at the sun in x-rays, it has a lot of structure to it. So this is one of the very famous, many of you have probably seen these x-ray images of the sun. And we're particularly interested in our case of these dark regions, these so-called coronal holes, because they look like they're basically not glowing. They, in fact, do have a lower density of plasma in the corona, and, but they also have a somewhat, um, yeah, temperature's not the issue. The, Okay. The main thing is that the solar wind that comes out of these coronal holes is characterized by a higher speed than the other types of solar wind. So we just refer to it as the high-speed solar wind. But we were thinking about the solar wind that comes from these X-ray dark coronal hole regions. The second kind of solar wind that we sampled is associated with the coronal mass ejections. Many of you have also seen a very spectacular picture of these. This is one from the solar mission. And these great big um, prominences, loops of magnetic clotheslines and magnetic field that trap the plasma on it, occasionally they break and the material spills out in the, one of these coronal mass ejections. <clears throat> and we collected a separate sample of those. And finally, what we just referred to is the low speed solar wind. It's maybe the most enigmatic of the three in terms of what is known. This is a picture from the Hanoda spacecraft, the most recent one. And Hanoda in Japanese means sunrise, and it is returned by far the most spectacular images of the surface of the sun yet done. This is taken in a very fancy way so that you don't see the enormous amount of light coming from the bulk of the sun, or what's known as the photosphere down here, but you can actually see the amount of light coming near the surface. And in particular, you see these little <coughs> spikes and rays of material. It looks like the material is heading out. That appears to be what it is. And it's believed that these spicules are, in fact, the source of the low solar solar wind, which is, in fact, the most abundant type of solar wind, but maybe the least understood in terms of its physics of its origin. Okay, let's go back to this idea of a transition between star and planet for the matter in our solar system today and where the solar nebula fits in. Let me discuss this in terms of what I'm going to refer to as a standard model for how the solar system formed, because it's sort of the basis for which we interpret the compositional data <clears throat> from planetary materials and from Genesis. Okay, the solar system formed 4.56 billion years ago. It formed by the collapse of a fragment of a giant molecular cloud, which became gravitationally unstable, and collapsed down to form a disk. They formed the sun and a residual disk of gas and dust, like I showed in that picture from Bill Hartman earlier on. That's what we refer to as the solar nebula. The, the, out of that solar nebula came the planets, uh, some of the material went in the sun, some of it got ejected from the solar system, and some of it went in the planets. Okay. There are many, many contemporary examples of analogs to the solar nebula. Let's just look at a few of these. This is a very famous example, one of the first ones, uh, first observations of a disk around another star. This is the disk around the star Beta Pictoris, which is a star that uh, maybe is pretty, pretty well along compared to where materials are being formed, uh, but still has a, a disk. In fact, what was done here was a, a mask was put over the center of the star to cut out the light. So you can see, the, in fact, the light in the disk around. That's a contemporary example of the solar nebula. This is hundreds of astronomical units in size, the astronomical unit being the distance from the Earth to the sun. So it's a fairly big feature. Here is another couple of examples from, from the Hubble Space Telescope from what are called propylids in the Orion Nebula. What you see in this case are disks these things, again, are hundred, hundreds of astronomical units in size. There are two different images which show that inside there is a star there. And you're seeing a scattered light from the light being emitted perpendicular to the, 
to the plane of this disk. You see it in silhouette because this is one of these big, bright um, regions in the Orion um, Nebula that's shining uh, towards Earth, and these things are in the line of sight, so they show up as saddle, shadows or silhouettes. Another, whoops, 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 whoops. That didn't happen before. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> All right, that was my third example, and I don't know. Uh, the wonderful magic of PowerPoint. Here, it's, it's, it, it, that's probably the worst that's going to happen, but there are some glitches coming up. Anyway, let's skip that beautiful image, which I unfortunately did not want to skip. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the standard model for how the solar system formed and how it relates to Genesis. Okay, so the idea is that the materials or the objects that we have in the solar system today they formed from a well-mixed, complex homogeneous solar nebula. Today, though, what we have is a great diversity in planetary objects and materials. The Saturn moons are the best examples of this. I mean, when the, when the spacecraft first started going to Saturn, I said, boy, is this going to be dull. One big piece of ice after another, you know, pictures of ice from here and there. Man, was that wrong. I mean, those, those are fascinating things. They're geologically active and everything. The, what space exploration has showed us is, near as we can tell, almost every object in the solar system is different. So we have a great amount of diversity. But we started off in the solar nebula that we believe was fairly homogeneous. And so the diversity evolved from the solar nebula by a fairly complex series of processes with different conditions and different events from a homogeneous nebula to form this great diversity of materials we have. A major clue to how all this happened, which is a major goal of planetary science, is the differences in composition between the starting point, the solar nebula, which is what Genesis has been trying to provide in terms of its isotopic and elemental composition, and any particular kind of planetary material. For example, one of the cometary dust grains returned by Stardust. And that's how you play the game. You look at the different composition and say, how did they get from, from the starting point to the final point? Okay, so any model is worth anything. We'll make some predictions. All right, they're predictions from the standard model. Uh, it's namely that the nebular elemental composition uh, should be preserved for us on the surface of the sun. Okay, the material, most of the material in the solar nebula flowed into the sun. Indeed, all kinds of interesting things have happened in the center of the sun to change its composition, but as far as we know, that has not affected the surface. So the composition of the surface of the sun retains the composition of the, the elements in the solar nebula. For isotopes, we can go even further. If everything was all mixed up, these differences in the chemical process of going from gas to ice or something like that do not produce major changes in the isotopic compositions. So we expect then, the prediction is the isotopic compositions of elements in the solar nebula should be the same as on the Earth. Okay. All right, the standard model is accurate enough to be useful. It's incomplete enough to keep us all busy, like that. And it's sufficiently wrong to make it very interesting. And it's wrong in terms of this idea that the isotopic composition should be the same Anywhere. So let me stick to my theme of auction and let's look now. Here's standard by is the glitch and I know it's going to happen. No, next, next slide anyway, sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't call my shots. All right. This is what went into the solar system in terms of auction isotopes. Out of meteorites, it's been possible over the years to learn how to recognize that meteorites contain some stuff that wasn't formed in the solar system. It's stuff, in fact, predates the solar system, what we call pre-solar rains. We recognize these. One of the ways we do it is that their isotopes are just wildly different. Okay. And so auction having three isotopes, 17, 16, and 18, you can plot a given isotopic composition as a point on a diagram like Ah, oh, thank you very much. A diagram like this. And when you, <clears throat> when you look at these pre-solar grains for meteorites, you find that there is a wide range they're, this is a logarithmic scale, so there are factors of thousands from one grain to the next in the ratios of 018 to 016 and the relative amounts of 017 to 016. Yet what we have in the solar system today, which we ooh and ah about because it's not a point, but in fact everything is down there in this box. So again, homogenization, yes, if we started off from stuff like this, we've gone down to things like that, but we did not go all the way to a dot. Okay. Again, the more adventures in PowerPoint. I don't know where this brown plaid stuff came from. <laughs> I think after 10 years, I learned how to do this stuff, but all right. Um, please ignore the brown plaid. In fact, you can see the essentials of the slide through the brown plaid. 
This is the actual data inside that box in the previous slide, the ratio of 018 to 017 to 016 and the ratio of 018 to 016 and different materials from the inner solar system what we have. Here is the Earth and the Moon and the Mars, which on this scale all plot in sort of that blue band there. They, in fact, are distinguishable on a blown up scale, but let's stop here. The various meteorites we have represent fragments of the asteroids, and they form a fairly big range through here in this light green area. And then there's some fairly exotic materials that are meteorites that we refer to as calcium aluminum rich inclusion or CAIs. These are probably the first materials to form in the solar system. And they are very, very different, but not in a random way. They seem to be systematically related along a trend which goes off in this way, which physically can, you can account for by taking something like the Earth and adding Tiro 16 to it. It's a very interesting trend. Okay. And so what we want to do is try to figure out where the sun relates to this and try to figure out where the, the solar system started here and moved up that way, or the solar system started here, and this is just some random freak stuff that did not get completely homogenized in the beginning. Okay, now, for reference, oxygen is special. It's not unique, but it's special. Most of the other elements in a periodic table are the same in terms of their isotopic abundances to a part in 10,000. You can see that these are big variations. That's 1% there. So this whole range of the data, small compared to that box in the previous slide, but still big compared to what we can measure. Uh, so that is 1%, the size of that bar there. Okay, say so a few words about how we did it. This is the spacecraft before it launched. These are the solar panels. There's a person for scale. This was not a very big spacecraft. When I was down to, to, um, to KSC for the launch, I visited the Genesis spacecraft. Then I went in to see the space shuttle. <laughs> Genesis spacecraft was a little thing. The space shuttle was... I didn't even realize I was underneath the thing when I, when I first walked underneath it. It's really fairly small on spacecraft standards. The, all our materials that we use to collect the solar wind are inside this, this, this uh, sample return capsule here. And let me point out that we do, did have some instruments on the spacecraft deck. This is an electron monitor, and over here is an ion monitor. These are standard spacecraft plasma instruments built by Los Alamos, and were very important in terms of recognizing the kind of solar wind regime that the spacecraft was in and deploying the corrective materials. Standard space solar wind instruments, but dedicated to the purposes of collecting a solar wind sample. Okay, so when you open the lid of the sample return capsule, what you see then is a can inside a can. This we refer to as the canister. And then when you look at it, open it up, it looks like this. And here is where all our materials are. This canister was built here at JPL and built very strong, which is a fortunate thing in terms of subsequent events. Uh, there are a variety of collectors shown here. Let me just talk about a few of them that I've shown in red and white here that are going to feature in the following slides. The most of our materials were on these uh, so-called arrays here. And once we were in flight and we opened it up and there was one in the, the cover of the canister, then depending on the kind of solar wind that was present and depending on what these monitors said, one of these three lower arrays was, was unfurled out. And then when the solar wind changed, that one went back in and another went out. And that was done hundreds of times. It worked perfectly throughout the whole mission. Okay, coming back didn't go so well. Um, <clears throat> we were unable to deploy our parachute, and so the thing hit the ground at like 300 miles an hour. And um, this was September, as was said in the introduction, September 8, 2004. So on that day, the Genesis Project literally hit bottom. And what we did on that day, it was we literally went out and picked up the pieces. Okay, and we started the long climb back from then, and that's what I'll tell you where we're going. Okay, there again is a close-up view of one of these collector arrays. Um, this is human being for scales, Andy Stone, then of JPL. The collector arrays considered, consisted of 55 hexagonal collectors, uh, about four inches point-to-point -point in the hexagons, and there are different materials. It looks a little more complicated here because you're looking at reflections in the room from which the picture was taken. So there's a fire alarm box. We, we did not launch, but that's, <laughs> but that's an image. These were very shiny, clean materials. Okay, so that was, uh, that was dates wrong, but that was in, in, no, that date's right. This is June 2000. Uh, same person, same array in September 2004, and there's not much left of it. It looked like in the previous crash picture, like the, the return capsule penetrated to the ground raw. 
the ground didn't give the return capsule. So basically everything came out sort of D-shaped. So there's the plane of impact. And there's nothing left on the array. That's partially true. There were some little pieces left, but we'd already taken those, taken those off. <clears throat> anyway, so then what we had, instead of those 250 hexagons, four inches inside, here's what we have. Uh, there is a human thumb for scale, and so you can see the size of things. But it's all recognizable in terms of what it is. We, we immediately could recognize what the stuff was. And so we have things now, instead of the 250 pieces, we have 15,000 pieces above a size which we think is sort of the minimum analyzable at present, which is like three millimeters in size. But we, it gives us a lot to work with. It's not what we plan to work with, but it still gives us a lot to work with. See, it's fairly common to see things that are sort of uh, centimeter size in the, the thumb for a comparison. And there, were, there was at least one whole hexagon and a few half hexagons recovered intact. Okay, so let's talk about the analysis of some of these things. Now here is the actual profile of, as a function of depth of solar wind magnesium in a carbon collector from one of these arrays. So this is basically what's nicely, actually is okay, it's clipped off in this case. <clears throat> the, um, this is basically the amount of magnesium as a function of depth as you drill down through this and analyze the magnesium as you go. Each one of these points corresponds to, let's say at the peak here anyway, uh, one or 2,000 atoms of the sun. We know it's solar magnesium because we know that there wasn't any, there's, there wasn't any magnesium at all that had been measured before, and it's got added, so that came from the sun. Also, even better, this distribution as a function of depth is pretty close to what we actually expected. I'm going to find my button here again. Expected from the sun. It goes up like that. Okay, and the red and blue colors refer to the fact that when we analyze the same different spot, we get the same answer. The most important thing, though, from this slide is that it's clear we can tell the solar wind from the contamination that we acquired on launch. So, again, there's just a little bit of stuff at the surface. It's, in the case of magnesium, fairly small, and we can tell the difference. So, this is Utah, sun, sun, Utah. Okay. The material is safe, okay? Despite the cra crash and the, all of those breaking up, you can't break up an atom, okay? <clears throat> and the dirt that it acquired from Utah is all out here, and the solar wind is safely down there. Now, down there is not very deep. This, the scale of here, is in angstroms. Let's try to visualize this. If you, if you don't think angstroms, to start out with something you know is an inch. An inch is 25 millimeters, so divide an inch into 25. And then divide that into 100,000 parts. And that's an angstrom. Okay. Now, so that's pretty small. On the other hand, we're pretty sensitive. An angstrom here, or let's say 100 angstrom here, is many, many atom layers in this collector material. <clears throat> so in terms of atom layers, the solar wind is safely buried from the dirt. And our job is to either ignore the dirt, as we did in this case, or clean it off. And that's, in fact, is our biggest challenge. Okay. Now... What we want to measure is the total number of atoms, um, total area, basically total area under this curve, which then gives us the number of atoms of square centimeters per square centimeter, what I call affluence, in this case of magnesium. And we have similar curves for iron. So I'm going to talk about iron for magnesium now. I'm going to talk about some of the science associated with the analysis of elements. Okay, so here's a science issue. Does the sun and the solar wind have the same elemental composition? We measure solar wind, we want sun. Are they exactly the same? Okay. Well, in terms of elements, it's been known for since about 1985, experiments first done by Ed Stone, the ex-director of JPL, that, in fact, the, some elements have been changed in terms of the relative proportions from the sun into the solar wind. But it has a regular pattern. If you have elements, which again, going back to that idea of the first ionization potential, it's the amount of energy it takes to create an ion from an atom, the elements that have a high first ionization potential tend to be left behind in the sun. <clears throat> Those that get ionized easily get accelerated out more easily. It's fairly intuitive. So, for example, iron, which is easily analyzed, is in greater abundance relative to helium in the solar wind <clears throat> than in the surface of the sun. Okay. Helium is hard to analyze, gets left behind. Iron is easily analyzed and gets taken out. 
What the data say is that for elements that are fairly easily analyzed in terms of this first ionization potential, less than nine electron volts the amount of energy it takes to do that, these elements appear to be unfractionated, which you can't tell the difference. Okay, the goal of Genesis is to test that at a higher level of precision, again, always looking at the composition of the sun. We will never escape knowing something about the sun independent of the solar wind to address this problem. Okay. Uh, but if we can do that, then this is a very useful set of elements because most of the elements we have in the terrestrial planets fall in this category of having this first ionization potential less than 9 eV. And so the great bulk of the periodic table in terms of improving solar element abundances is available to us. Okay, so let me get a little bit technical here. Uh, to, tell, to talk about the difference between an element in the solar wind and the sun, let me talk about the relative, uh, relative values of two elemental ratios, what I'm gonna call a fractionation factor here. So let's say X is iron, so I might talk about the, the ratio of iron to magnesium in the solar wind compared to iron to magnesium in the sun. Okay, and to illustrate what the <coughs> spacecraft data show us, um, here are a set of data from the Ulysses mission. Which have, <coughs> has these fractionation factors um, for several elements relative to magnesium. And you can see that in terms of take either iron, magnesium, or silicon, it indicates they're not fractionated. But if I start going out here to sulfur, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and helium, they tend to get be lower. In other words, these elements out here are left behind. Okay, so this is the data set that we're trying to test and improve on. Okay, <clears throat> so when I take the results from those profiles that I showed you earlier for magnesium and for iron, and I calculate an iron to magnesium ratio, because it's only the relative bunch of two elements that that's really what means anything, here's what you have. This is our result here, and this, this band here represents sort of the uncertainties in our measurement. There is the value from the photosphere. That's your standard point of reference for everybody. And again, here, just for reference, is the spacecraft data from Ulysses for the slow, low-speed solar wind. You can see that within the errors, these things are all the same. Again, there's no evidence for any of this first dynasty potential fractionation, which is what was predicted here, but we're off to a good start. So our goal from now on is to look at other element ratios with a range of first dynasty potentials and see if we can confirm this idea that the these low first dynasty elements are not fractionated, and then try to use that as a bootstrap way to improving our knowledge of actual solar elemental composition. Okay, now there's another way to do this comparison. If you look in the scientific literature for the composition of the sun, you will see tables of the relative abundances of the elements. The data in most cases will not come from the sun. They'll actually come from a very special type of meteorite known as C.I. chondrite, which as far as anybody know or can tell, has solar composition. So in terms of iron to magnesium, there's the iron to magnesium ratio for C.I. chondrite, there's the iron to magnesium ratio in the photosphere, and within the airs, they agree. And you can do that for a lot of other elements. And so on that basis, it's been proposed that you can use these meteorites to tell you the composition of the sun. Again, you're never gonna be any better than this comparison. Well, here's where we are in terms of Genesis right now, okay? Again, as we showed before, we are in agreement with the photosphere within their errors, but here we're beginning to see so, so, some signs that we're not in agreement with the CI value now. Um, this would be very important, it was true. Let's say this whole idea that these things have preserved exactly the solar composition is not true. That's a little premature. The reason is this error bar is pretty much what we're gonna have. On the other hand, there are independent calibrations of the amounts of these things which we need to check. And so the point in this error bar together can move a little bit up and down on this plot. When we get done, it may move back in line with the red point here, or it may get even worse. We don't know. We're in the process of doing that right now. It illustrates the power of what you have when you have a sample back here. We can, we not have a difference. We can go a long way to showing that that difference is correct. We can document the accuracy in this by replica measurements. We've done that. We can measure by different techniques. We've actually done that. And we can independently calibrate the, the instruments that produce this, and that's what we're in the process of doing. So we have a lot of power in terms of data quality <clears throat> and having a sample to work with back here on Earth. And I will come back to that at the end. 
Okay, to do the analysis of Genesis, we couldn't just bring the stuff back in the mission and say, come and get it. We would be giving a party and nobody would come. The analysis of Genesis required, in most many cases, instruments that had not yet been built. So we had to build our own. So in fact, the spacecraft part of the Genesis mission ended in 2004. The Genesis mission, per se, is going to go on through this September. And what we, so what we've had to do is well as build a new generation of what we call advanced analytical instruments, uh, the AAIFs. And here's an example of one. This is so-called a resonance ionization mass spectrometer. It's been built in Argonne. Igor Veryovkin is a guy who designed a thing, built it, put every screw in together, and knows how to run it very well. But one thing I want you to notice is notice the size of this. You ain't going to fly that on a spacecraft. This thing weighs many, many times the weight of the whole Genesis spacecraft. Okay? When you have things back here on Earth, you can use all the power that you have in modern technology to get the data that you want. All right, I am going to talk about the data from this. This is built at UCLA. This is so-called Megasims. Uh, Kevin McKeegan is in charge of the laboratory of the air and a guy who inspired and designed this. The instrument itself runs from behind out here all the way around and back. There are people for scale around back in here like that. It fills up a whole room. Okay. Close-up view, there is Peter Mao, who was the guy who put most of it together beside one segment of it for scale. So you can see that we can use very powerful techniques and very, develop very powerful instruments because we don't have any real constraint. You know, we can use as much power as we can afford to buy and so forth. Okay, well, here's this infamous brown plaid again, this diagram. At least you recognize the diagrams, the one that I've all got all screwed up. <clears throat> the ratio of auction 17 to auction 16 to auction 18 to 16, same material before. Okay, what, we're, what we were out to do with Genesis is try to say what was the auction isotopic composition would have started everything. This auction isotopic composition is solar nebula. So the question is, where is the sun? Is it up here somewhere, which means that you know the... the Materials in the inner solar system more or less defined, came out of what more or less reproduced what was in the solar nebula. And this stuff was very odd, exotic stuff. Or did it start down here and the whole inner solar system evolved up there? <clears throat> so that was one of sort of the zeroth order stakes. And we, we can address what happened. I can't tell you why. We're not sure yet. But anyway, it looks something like this. Okay. This, <laughs> the wonders of PowerPoint. This was supposed to be a big, bright asterisk. Anyway, it turns out to be that, whatever it is. Anyway, that's our data point for Genesis. You can see it's down here. Okay. So it's very, very different from anything we've seen before in the inner solar system, except these exotic CAI things. And it lies somewhere, probably lies somewhere in that trend. Now, I have to be a little bit technical again. Again, we have some corrections with that we still need to work out for this. So this point may, in fact, move on a line which is like this, which in fact is parallel to this red line up here. This red line is everything that we've seen pretty much naturally on Earth. The Earth, in terms of physical and chemical processes, does vary the isotopic composition of oxygen, but it does it in a very regular way, and things move along this line. So I can find, very rare, but I can find some materials on Earth that are out here, but it's here and not here. The corrections we have yet to make on our data are going to move us along a parallel line like that. We will never, any of our uncertainties correction will never put us like the Earth. We are different from the Earth. We may be a little bit uncertain of where we are in a sense like this, but we are not up there. We are well resolved from that. Okay. Let's see. All right, so I guess, yeah, let me finish this before I move on. Then it looks like what you have to say is that the solar nebula, the simplest way, the solar nebula started by here, and they were processed in the solar nebula that at least accompanied the formation of everything we have in the inner solar system or maybe had some reason for causing it. That we don't know. That's speculation to know this, that, in fact, the, the thing that formed the planets out of the solar nebula here in fact, change the oxygen isotopic composition or whether it's something that just went along or it's a parallel thing. That we don't know. But anyway, we know where we started from, and then what we also know is the Earth is the odd man out. So to, to paraphrase what was said in Sky and Telescope in reporting this, is that basically Genesis to Houston is the Earth that has a problem. We are the, the Earth is the odd part of the solar system in terms of the oxygen isotopic composition. 
The sun, it looks to be very different from the earth. Okay, so that's an interesting result. Let's go on to a different element. Let's talk about nitrogen now. <clears throat> nitrogen only has two isotopes, seven protons, eight neutrons, oxygen 15, seven protons, seven neutrons, oxygen 14. So an oxidized topic composition is one number, so I can't plot it on a graph. But I can make a little plot like this, which basically plots, in this case, the Earth today is up here. We will call that zero and measure the percent deviation of any other kind of nitrogen from the Earth. <clears throat> and you can see there are things in the solar system that are above and below it. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> now, this axis means nothing. It's just a way of spreading out. So this is just a series of numbers with air bars. Okay, so let's just look at various things in the solar system. The moon, over the course of the history of the solar system, has soaked up material from the sun from the solar wind. It was originally believed that we could go to the surface materials of the moon, look at the isotopic composition of nitrogen, and get the isotopic composition of the solar wind. It turned out to be very confusing because there was a whole range of values, ranging anywhere from 20% below, that's what we have on the Earth today, to 20% above. The only correlation is that the solar wind incorporated in the lunar materials a long time ago tend to be down here and it happened more recently tend to be up there, and that's all we knew about it. The meteorites weren't much help here. Meteorite materials show a wide range of nitrogen composition. I mean, we're a little bit less than 15 in the Earth to way above. Okay. The atmosphere of Mars is very enriched in N15. It's generally believed to be associated with the escape of the atmosphere of Mars. We will come back to that a little bit. But the star of the show for many years has been Jupiter here. This is a number from the Galileo probe. It's been verified by spectroscopy on the ammonia in the Jovian atmosphere, and it is a whopping 40% less in nitrogen-15 compared to nitrogen-14 than what you have on Earth. So the smart money says the Earth's odd. The Earth's got funny things happen to it. It'll be down here somewhere. Okay, and the answer is it's there. Uh, in terms of nitrogen, so it was like the Earth. So we have oxygen pulling us one way, nitrogen pulling us another way. Our data have really rather big error bars. We will have this much more precisely, but it's here and it's not there. It's not there. So again, the Earth and the, and the Earth and the Sun seem to be fine. It's Jupiter that's different here. It says that maybe our thinking about how simple the solar nebula is maybe needs to have another iteration that uh, what is happening has turned to be, out, be a lot more um, variety than we actually thought. Again, we don't know what's going on here. We, we have just had these numbers for a few months now. Okay, let's turn to yet another element. Let's talk about neon. Uh, you are breathing neon in this room. The, it has three isotopes, but let's look at the most abundantly. is neon 20, which is roughly 10 times that more abundant than neon 22. This is the one number that was known precisely in the solar wind because of experiments done during Apollo by the University of Barrett where they set out foils, collected the solar wind for a few days, and they were able to measure helium and neon in these. So they, in fact, knew that the neon isotopic composition of the sun was very different than that of the Earth. That was, one of the, in fact, one of the inspirations for doing Genesis. This is a botched-up table. Again, but just all you need to know is that number and that number. That's the Earth's atmosphere. This is 9.8, like that. In terms of its ratio of neon 2022, in the solar wind, this is our number, which is 13.97, which agrees with the Apollo number. It's more precise, but it doesn't make any difference. The big difference is 13.97 versus 9.8. There's a huge difference. Okay, what we have done is shown, as you can see, clearly for the first time, a difference in the isotopic composition of argon. There are two isotopes that are important here: argon 36 and 38. Okay, uh, this is the value for the Earth. Again, uh, the person doing this didn't like to have things blank down here, so he put it, put a wind of day measurement for me, but it really doesn't make any difference. It's only the number up here that counts, and these are just, just a histogram then of the different numbers. Okay, the Apollo foils could not resolve the difference between the solar wind and the Earth. Spacecraft data are just not precise enough for this. There were numbers floating around from lunar sample analysis that indicated that this ratio was higher than the Earth's atmosphere, but they didn't agree among themselves. There's our number here now, data from Washington University in St. Louis. That's the size. It's very precisely known. The solar wind is enriched by that much in the argon 36. The sense of it and the relative magnitudes 
are consistent with the idea that just like with Mars, we had time to discuss Venus, just like Venus, the Earth's atmosphere was lost early in the history of the Earth and it's produced changes in the isotopic composition of neon and argon. So that fits very well. Uh, but we have a problem, Earth. Go back to here. You would have expected, and all the smart money was saying this, that because of the neon and argon, the Earth's atmosphere today had started down here somewhere, and then the escaped had moved it up to where it was today. So everybody was saying, aha, aha, it's going to be down here somewhere. It isn't true. So indeed, if this idea of the isotopic variations in neon and argon are due to loss of the Earth's atmosphere, you've got to have some special pleading or some reason why it doesn't show in nitrogen as well. Okay. All right, let me sort of close out here uh, by talking in a very broad way about Genesis as a class of missions, sample return missions. And these things have major advantages. I've tried to point these out as I've gone along. Let me sort of summarize it here. <clears throat> in, a, in a sample return mission, you have a large science return. Materials, whether it's rock, whether it's a sample of an atmosphere, it's the solar wind from solar system bodies, record how they, those bodies got that way. They record the information on origin and evolution. Complex, hard to read, but the record is there. The moon... Sometime in the future, maybe five years from now, I could hopefully put together a sense of what the overall science return in Genesis has been. A little premature to do that at this point, but I can point to the moon. It's the best understood extraterrestrial object because we've had the Apollo samples back. We know more about the moon than any other planet because of our ability to study these materials. With a sample return mission, you can solve your problems. You never want to crash a spacecraft. If you're going to crash a spacecraft, the best planet to crash one on is the Earth. You can go out and pick up the pieces, and then, and then you can do anything. You can use all the powers of modern technology to solve your problems. Let me give an example, and I was going to do this before you, but before I saw Jim Balfour there. Um, when the we first brought back the pieces of the self-return capsule in Utah. And we figured out, now, what do we got in here? How do we get it apart? The first thing they did was they went out to hardware stores in Salt Lake City, and they bought every tool imaginable. They didn't know what it was going to take to get the thing apart. In the end, it was sort of you know, crowbars, crowbars and tin snips. Okay. Uh, but they bought everything imaginable because they didn't know that they could cover the bases and they could afford to do it. A few hundred dollars worth of tools, they knew they were going to do the job. Southwest, or the Salt Lake City hardware stores were glad to see them. They, they, they did a lot of business that day. But we had the capability of running out to the hardware store and buying what we need to get that thing apart and recover the materials in it. So that's the symbols example. We've been pursuing that ever since. I can give you many, many more examples on that. Okay, to continue, we use advanced instrumentation. I've tried to show you some of the instruments we use. But... Nothing is ever frozen in time. We can always use the best instruments because the samples are there waiting for the instruments, not the instruments waiting to arrive at a sample. The instrumentation is not limited by mass, power, reliability, data rate. If a thing breaks, we fix it. Okay. If something breaks out there, you're in real trouble. If it breaks, we fix it. We lose a month, we're back on the air again. Okay. We work. It, it's, it's the real, it's the, excuse me, the real world. Okay. Uh, we don't have to work by ourselves, so forth. We can use things that are big. I've showed you instruments that are bigger, weighing much more than the Genesis spacecraft. I could show you some that are big as NASA centers. We've using, we're using the big synchrotron ring at the Advanced Photon Source, which is a good fraction of a mile in diameter. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, much more, it's a much more lower-cost way to do the analyses. And if one, we're doing things in parallel. One thing breaks, the rest, everything else keeps on going. Okay. And whenever somebody has something new, the samples are there waiting for them. The samples are being curated. Some will always be left behind. Participation. A large number of people can usefully participate in the science. And in the case of Genesis, Genesis sample analysis is being analyzed worldwide in 28 different laboratories as we speak. The analysis is iterative. We don't have to go out to test a certain theory. 
we can respond to whatever we find, and we can respond quickly. We can follow up very fast, and we have interesting results. If we're on track to measure what we want to measure, then, in fact, this is probably the most important advantage of a sample return mission is the quality of the data. We can afford to replicate important results. Everything I've shown you today, we have or will replicate. We can verify important results by independent techniques, the normal way you do science. Okay. Anything that's funny, the nitrogen ice type of composition looks funny, we will check it out. Those error bars will reduce, we will see, we will analyze it by different ways. We will know in a year or two whether that stands the test of time or whether it needs to move a little bit. Okay, the literature is better off. You know, you, when something, something goes wrong and you're not sure of it, you don't have to wait 10 years to check it out again. We can check it out in a much shorter last time. Okay, summary, it's going fairly slowly. Okay, but we've come a long way since the crash. Despite the crash, we had a long list of things that we put down. We had a list of 19 so-called measurement objectives for Genesis that we wanted to do. We are not giving up on any. Some of them are really in trouble. Some of them are really hurt by the crash and the dirt, but we're not giving up on any of them. As I said, these samples are out being studied in 28 different laboratories around the world. And as I've tried to show you here, the results are emerging and with some significant accomplishments on some of our major objectives, our number one objective was the oxygen isotopes, our number two was nitrogen. Buried in the other, I've shown you three and four actually there without talking about it. What I'd like you to go away with is, is this, which I've tried to color in the best shade of green I can get out of PowerPoint. Remember this and not that, okay? Uh, this, not that. So I will go back there. Thank you very much. Open for questions, yes. You showed a, you showed a plot of uh, concentration versus, versus depth. How do you accurately kind of etch down at the various le levels of the instrument accuracy levels? Okay, that, uh, <clears throat> the instrument that was used there is called a secondary ion mass spectrometer. It uses a sputtering process. So basically, you take an ion beam and then you, you so called raster, you spread it around over a known area. And then and then you can vary, the, you basically, we basically work in a range that's, uh, say, five angstroms per second, something like that. We know what that is because after we let it run to where it digs in, let's say, a few thousand angstroms, then we can measure the depth of that. So, so then we can know the rate. Once we know the rate, then we can go back and get the depth scale. Well, you've got things going both ways. Uh, you've got he, what he's referring to is Stardust has found materials from the VIL-2 coma which have been made at very high temperatures, which the only place we know in the inner solar system to get high temperatures is close to the sun. So there was material that formed close to the sun and was now out at 40 astronomical units, which was the place where we believe the comet originated. So there are things that are moving around and being stirred up. On the other hand, we have um, in our results that the inner solar system of nitrogen looks different than the outer solar system, and uh, which goes the other way. So um, Stardust, in fact, doesn't see any of the big isotopic differences that we do in their materials yet, but they've just begun to scratch their way around on these things. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing in Stardust that's been seen that, well, let's say, the one way which you think you can do it is based on the nitrogen isotopes that would represent outer solar system material. The, uh, what, they, what part of the Stardust sample that's been looked at for nitrogen isotopes looks like um, inner solar system material. It looks, if anything, towards the high N15 side. So there's been, uh, what, what Stardust has been, it's been easy to find things that look like they form the inner solar system <clears throat> What's been hard to find so far is something that looks like it formed in the outer solar system. I danced around your question, but I, you know, it's everything is so it's, everything is sort of a state of flux right now. What's the uh, L1 Lagrange point? Okay, that's basically the point at which the gravitational forces between the Earth and Sun are balanced. 
So since the sun is a lot more massive, it's very close to the Earth. And so it's basically in, in, in terms of, it's a potential energy minimum. And so if you put a spacecraft there, you have to work to keep it there because it wants to roll out. But it's a nice, stable place. It's easy to get to. It's cheap to get to. It's a parking lot for spacecraft that observe the sun. <clears throat> and it's basically it takes advantage of the fact that the, there's a balance of forces, gravitational forces, between the Earth and sun. and makes it sort of 1% of the distance. So it's, it's convenient, easy, handy, accessible. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any elements in the samples that are... Uh didn't expect to see in the amounts and ratios from the sun, from the spectrum okay. of the sun, uh, that you saw in the samples? Okay. We are after the quantitative parts, the relative amounts. There is no reason to believe that anything in the universe doesn't have all of these 83 elements in nature. You pick up a speck of anything with modern analytical techniques, you can measure the whole periodic table in it. Um, the sun has every element that's on the Earth. Every star in the galaxy has the same set of elements. There's no reason to believe otherwise. The amounts of them will vary. Yeah, that's what I mean, mean. Yeah, the amounts yeah. will, yeah. will vary considerably. But that's, but that's a matter of chemistry and process and rather than you know, the fact that the, um, the elements in nature are all made by stars one way or another, and there's a little bit of them everywhere. Um, on your graph with the relative amount isotopes of oxygen, you had the big, you had the amount on the photosphere of the sun, which had a really, really big er error bar. It's bars. very hard to measure here in the sun. How did, was that measurement taken? The sun is pretty hot, and so most every material, almost all the elements in the sun are either atoms or ions. Uh, but in the outer region, there are a few molecules. And so in the spectra of molecules, you can see isotopic differences. And that's how those are determined. For carbon monoxide, for example, you can see a certain amount of carbon monoxide, and the and the if you replace an O18 with an O16 in the carbon monoxide molecule, the the wavelength of the lines are somewhat different. So you can do it that way. So it's a very difficult thing to do, and it's very hard to do precisely. How many, how many total hexagons did you have? And what percentage of them have been analyzed at least once? And how much sample are you going to leave for the next generation? Okay, let me start with the easy part of that. I have no idea how many of them we've analyzed because we don't have any hexagons. All we have are the pieces. I will never be able to answer that question. Um, how many did you start with? We started with basically uh, 5 times 55, so 250, something like that. We have one full one, a few half ones, and then it goes down from goes down from there. But as you can see, those pieces are useful. Pieces are useful. I mean, we're having trouble with experiments where we wanted to use have a hexagon for an analysis. That we're having trouble with. But we have to put together enough smaller pieces to try to do those experiments. <clears throat> but um, we've been slowed down considerably in that one. And your other question is, how much are we going to leave behind? How much are you going to leave behind for the curator? Well, well see... <laughs> A lot less than what we thought we were. <laughs> uh, we, we had considerable losses. I'm, you know, it, it depends on the material and depends on the array and everything like that. But we have probably lost 80% of the material that's been pulverized down to less than my three millimeter cutoff like that. We still got a lot left in our 20% remaining, uh, but we, we've undergone tremendous losses. And uh, we're a long way from using it up. We're nowhere near the point where we have to worry about giving away something unique or giving away the last piece of something. We're a long way from that. Um, we will assume that our successors are a lot better, smarter than we are. So we'll leave them, we'll leave them smaller amounts of material because they're going to be better than we are. <laughs> what would be a, uh, an ideal follow-up mission to, you know, to take more samples more than what we know today. You know. What would you like to have happen? After? You're talking about, it's talking about solar wind now. Yes, solar wind. It's funny. Uh, I always get I almost can guarantee I'm going to get asked that question. Because it's funny. I never until I started giving these talks. I never never realized that. We said in our proposal, if we do it right, you won't have to ever do this again. Have we done it right? Ask me in five years. I think though there will always be things left undone that you would like to know. Whether they're, they're not important enough to justify doing that again, 
that will be a, a decision in five or ten years to, to think about. The one place where you could do it fairly cost effectively, if we ever do have a lunar base, which we go back time and time again, where you could set out some of these collectors and then leave them and harvest them periodically so you can think about leaving things out for 10, 20 years, that's an attractive way to do it. That's an attractive way to do it, but that would not in, its, in and of itself justify our lunar base. It's a separate issue. If you had a lunar base, this would be a good thing to do. My question is the one minus the solar wind question. What do you think would be the next great sample to get from out there just in general? My, my answer is, is highly prejudicial. You ask anybody in my field and they'll give you the, I, I would love to have a piece of some of the Martian moons. Okay, okay. The Mars sample return, I can, I can produce a rationale for it. I have not thought hard and deep enough about it to know whether a Mars sample return is really cost effective or not. It, is, it will be expensive, but at some point, when after you run many, many, many rovers, do you want to bite the bullet and do it? I, that, that's a hard question. The small bodies, in the inner solar system are fair game. As I said, everything that we know about has been different. If you go to a second comet than the other two, I bet it's going to be different. Okay. We have shown, between we between Genesis and Stardust, we have shown that you can do affordable missions on the small bodies in the inner solar system. There is an enormous number of interesting targets there. The simplest thing would be, all right, find another Vil 2 and go get it. <laughs> That you know how to do, you know you can do it. Do it. Do just do that one again. That just shouldn't cost very much. Okay, you should be able to fairly affordably do robotic sample returns from the moon, independent of whether or not you have a lunar base and a lunar program. You should be able to figure out. I mean, the Soviet Union did it in 1975 successfully. Come on, we can do it. We can do it. Okay, and we can afford to do it. So when you consider small bodies. Our moon, Mars moons, asteroids, comets, you have you know, years and years of great, affordable, small mission science right there. Any thoughts on how you'd get enriched, like with Jupiter or maybe the Earth, uh, losing nitrogen uh, 14 and then being enriched? Any thought on how you might get enriched in a lower mass uh, element? That one's, a little hard. Hard. that one's a little hard. If, um, the main difference between the Earth and Jupiter, of course, is Jupiter has captured a large fraction of the gas that was originally in the solar system. And so it would be very easy to say the Sun and Jupiter are different from the Earth. It didn't come out that way. So it's much, you really have to stand on your head, other than saying that uh, at the time the outer planets formed, there was a time dependence of what was coming into the solar nebula from the molecular cloud, and it was just different. It was just different. But I'm making this all up. I don't know. One of the benefits of, of your work is, is showing uh, the origins of the Earth, right? Are there other benefits uh, from it? Or can you Our main, the main handle on the origin of the Earth was through these, this, the issue of atmospheric loss. And we're, we're, we're well started into that. The um, ice topping difference in neon between the Earth and the solar wind has been known for years. And people have used that as a basis for modeling. Well, we are providing data on the other noble gases. We have, we have data on argon. We will fairly soon have data on krypton and xenon to see there if you can, um, can put together a consistent model which would reproduce the observed isotopic fractionations of the noble gases. Uh, I would say I was very surprised to see the nitrogen came out where it did because I, I, really, I really believed it was going to be down somewhere with Jupiter. And so you're going to have to have some special pleading right now that the nitrogen was bound up chemically in something in the Earth and was not in the atmosphere at the time this escaped. I don't know. don't know. Uh, would atmospheric escape be bolstered by seeing a greater differential in isotopes that have a greater mass difference? Yeah, that's the, <clears throat> that's the way it goes. It's, um, it's uh, much... It's. 38% for neon, and it's a fraction of a percent for argon. So it, it, the heavier it is, the smaller the effect. But again, we compensate a little bit of that in krypton and xenon by having a big range. Krypton isotopes go all the way from 78 to 84. 
And whereas our gun only went from 36 to 38, so we compensate a little bit for that back there, yeah. Uh, did you ever figure out why the parachute didn't open? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, there was a, a switch that was a, an accelerometer that was put in backwards. And, uh, and it, never, it was sitting there re ready to tell the parachute to open, but it never got the right signal. You mentioned these curated samples of future research. Is there anything particular you have to do to curate them for a long period of time? Reason. We selected materials that would be stable in air and um, should not be uh, require any very special equipment to curate them. They, in fact, as a matter of course, keep them in, in, in nitrogen gas, okay, which is pretty inert stuff. Um, but uh, to some extent, that's overkill. So, no, you just have to you know, handle them with respect, be careful. You know. And the, as, you, as you can guess, with those 15,000 pieces, the bookkeeping is a big issue. Like that.